One Piece has one of the most diverse group of villains in all of anime and probably fiction. From Buggy D Clown to this Eminem knockoff, and even dictators like Doflamingo. If you have a favorite flavor of bad guy, Oda has you covered. In fact, there are 10 different categories of villains in One Piece, from characters like Usopp, whose values clash against Luffy, to insurmountable walls like Shanks. All of these guys throughout their career have had beef with our protagonists, but who stands at the top? Well, to answer that question, I will be looking at all 59 major arc antagonists and ranking them to see what they did well, where they might have failed, and just how they stack up against one another. With that said though, let's jump into Buggy to see exactly how we'll be sorting them. Buggy D. Clown is the longest running antagonist in the series, with his role beginning as really the first enemy that Luffy faces who puts up a decent fight at all. He then returns in Logtown and almost kills Luffy if it wasn't for the act of Dad, and Luffy's journey would have ended over 20 years ago. Of course, that wasn't the case, and we would see Buggy again in Impel Down, where he actually partners up with Luffy. There, he also builds a cult-like following as we head into Marineford, after which he gets made into both a warlord and a Yonko by continuing to fail upwards. Hell, he even found his way into working with Mihawk and Crocodile in Cross Guild, ironically making him one of the few pirates in the world with the resources available to reach for the One Piece. With Buggy being so iconic and so early to be introduced, it was only fitting that we use him as an example of how we will be ranking these characters. So, each antagonist will be given a score from 1 to 5 in 6 different categories. We will then take those scores and assign them a place on our scale. In general though, 1 means they are irrelevant in this category, 2 is a very weak demonstration of that category, 3 is mid, it's just okay, it's not great, it's not bad, 4 is good or above average, and 5 is amazing. I won't go over every score for every character, I mean, you already see how long this video is, but at the very least I will have a graph on screen letting you know what they received. With that said though, let's talk about what these categories actually are. First, the impact. How important to the story is this character? Do they make a significant change? Do they stick around? Do they affect the world as a whole? Or is their story very isolated? Buggy, as I mentioned, is a character who almost kills Luffy. He helps him get through Impel Down, he becomes a warlord and a Yonko, he forms Cross Guild and starts hunting marines. As goofy as he is, Buggy actually leaves a pretty significant mark on the story. However, because he's almost always used for comic relief, this impact tends to be a very surface level thing, so he will be getting a 4 in the impact category. Second, how threatening is this character within their own arc? Buggy is obviously weak as hell. He is entirely show and can't back up anything that he's talking about. However, he isn't completely useless in the arc that he's introduced, so I'll give him a 2 overall. Design is third, and it's one of my favorite elements in One Piece. Do these characters look good? Do their body, clothing, and accessories fit the theme of the character? Are they unique and interesting? Buggy has several unique designs throughout the story. His striped shirt matches the idea of his chop chop fruit separating his body. He's had several different styles of face painting. The Buggy the Star Clown design is a physical representation of him trying to make people think he is big and important. On top of that, by definition, he was designed to be a reflection of Luffy, where Luffy stretches, Buggy splits. Luffy bounces blunt damage off of himself but is weak to slashes, while Buggy is the opposite. Luffy idolizes Shanks, while Buggy resents him. He's just a good and creative character with a solid 5 in design. The fourth category is the character's personal story. Are they, in isolation, interesting? Are they connected with the characters, places, or events around them? Or do they just kinda rock the lone wolf thing and not interact with anyone else in any way? For example, Buggy has a whole flushed out story on Roger's crew and with Shanks. He has a personal journey of trying to earn the respect that he believes he deserves, even if it isn't true at all. The only problem that I have with Buggy's story is that he is very much a victim of circumstance now. He doesn't really have any agency over his own life, and he really hasn't since he became that cult leader figure in Impel Down. To keep up appearances, he needs to be this larger-than-life character, but it definitely isn't by choice. It's a good bit, 
but I do wish that there was something that he was more tangibly working on that he wanted to achieve. Four points for story. The fifth category is strength. I'm using that as a very loose term though. This can be physical strength, political power, influence over others, notoriety, anything like that. Buggy has very little in terms of combat power, but he is a Yonko. He is the leader of Crossgill. He has all the social influence in the world, and as a result, he still gets a 5 despite how weak he is. He is the perfect example of how a weak character can be powerful within the world of One Piece. And finally, how good or evil is this character? Their morality and their conviction. This one is a little bit different because it goes both ways, but someone like Garp or Fujitora would score very high because they have a strong sense of positive morality, but so would people like Blackbeard and Doflamingo who have a very strong sense of negative morality. I'm basically judging this off of conviction to be good or bad. So for example, the less a bad character cares about being bad, the lower their score will be here. In Bucky's case, he is selfish. He's willing to screw other people over, but he isn't anything crazy, so he'll be getting a 3 here. Now, a 5 would be someone who does evil, but really gets off on doing it. It is intentionality and enthusiasm that makes the difference between a 3 and a 5. So, with all of those points together, Buggy gets a total score of 23 and lands in the B tier. Now, real quick, some characters will also have classification tags. For example, Buggy fits in as a mirror to Luffy, as I mentioned earlier. There will be plenty of reflection characters like this throughout the series that hold up a mirror to Luffy, his goals, and his abilities, but Buggy is easily the most iconic, and forgive the pun, the most on-the-nose example. Now going forward, we'll be doing things in chronological order, so let's jump to Higuma. Higuma is definitely not the most exciting antagonist in the story. In fact, he's just very plain. He's a stereotypical mountain bandit, and there's not much left to him. However, the role he plays is actually pretty important. Because Higuma is such a bastard of a leader, he allows Shanks to show Luffy what it means to be a good captain and a great pirate. He opens the door for Luffy to learn that some battles aren't worth fighting, that pirates don't have to loot and pillage, and that loyalty is everything, even if Higuma is doing that through Shanks. With no Higuma, Shanks doesn't sacrifice his arm for Luffy. He doesn't give him Roger's hat. He doesn't teach him the difference between being a man and being a good man. Higuma has huge ramifications for Luffy, but he's low impact overall, so we'll average that out by marking him right in the middle as a 3. Onto his threat level, and he is obviously horrifying when we compare him to a young Luffy, but when we consider that Shanks is the one that was dealing with him, he's much less intimidating. He gets a 2 here. As for design, Higuma kinda looks like an NPC in the early stages of a Fire Emblem game, so he's a 1. That also goes for his story as well, he has absolutely zero flavor or depth to him, and he has no ties to the world as a whole. In terms of strength and influence, he has very little of anything going on here either. Sure, he can threaten to kill people, but like, that's about as low power as you're gonna get even in this arc. I mean, Luffy isn't even afraid of him until he's put into actual danger. The homie has negative conqueror's hockey. That is a one. And finally, we have morality. In Higuma's case, he is selfish, he is hateful, and he literally does not think twice about throwing a kid into the sea, but he won't do any of that until someone upsets him. The only reason that he does all that to Luffy is because Luffy kinda goes after him. So I'll give him a 3 here as well, which gives him a grand total of 11 out of a possible 30 points, and places him squarely in the F tier. Our first major antagonist once we hit the main story though is Alvida a brutally cold and egotistical pirate who leads her crew through fear. That is, until Luffy launches her across the sky, she finds the smooth, smooth fruit, and then she joins Buggy's crew. Alvida gets points for having two unique designs early on, but outside of that, she isn't really anything special. 
However, that is by design. She is meant to be there so that we can see what Luffy is capable of, which is why we have Kobe talking her up and then her still getting one shot. Because she exists purely to show Luffy off, Alvida falls into the category of fodder, characters meant to demonstrate the growth or power of the protagonists. You can think of the new Fishmen pirates after the time skip. They exist to get rolled so that we can really feel like the Straw Hats are larger than life. She does develop some kind of interest in Luffy after he beats her, but like, there's never follow up on that because after Logtown, they just do not meet again, which is kind of weird, honestly. I think it's fair to say that she's pretty weak overall, and she'll be getting 12 points. Over in Shellstown, we get introduced to Captain Axe Hand Morgan. While he isn't super deep, he is the first time that we come across a tyrant character. Someone who rules with an iron fist, or I guess in his case, maybe an iron axe. Morgan glorifies himself to satisfy his ego and pride. These are relevant because he's standing in opposition of Luffy and his heavy belief in freedom and dreams. And him being a marine is also very important, as through that we are introduced to the idea that regardless of who you are, pirates like Alvida, bandits like Higuma, or marines like Morgan, anyone can be evil, just as anyone can be good. Morality is up to the individual, not the group that they are in. Outside of being used to lay some moral foundation though, Morgan's very bare bones and we're gonna give him a 13. On to Captain Kuro, a pirate meant to show us that brains can be just as deadly as brawn. Kuro has this interesting disregard for his crew's life, literally slaughtering them with one of his attacks without a second thought. And when we consider that the whole arc of Syrup Village is meant to show what it takes to be a captain between Luffy and Usopp, then you see how Kuro is an example of what not to do. That said, once his plan gets exposed, there isn't really any follow-through on the idea of intelligence. He doesn't set up a trap for the Straw Hats or fight creatively, he literally turns his brain off and just starts swinging wildly. There is a disconnect between what we are told about him and how he actually fights, and I think that kind of hurts his character overall. But Kuro brings with him another category, flavor. Some characters function to add world building and depth to One Piece. For example, Kuro tells us about how he faked his death and let Morgan take the credit for it, which ultimately resulted in Morgan being made into a captain. Through Kuro, we get to learn more about how the world around us was built up. We also see this in characters like Foxy with the Davy Back fight, or even through Arlong's past with Fisher Tiger. They make the world feel more alive and lived in without the need for the Straw Hats to be present in their stories. In general though, Kuro is just kinda lackluster, but he does just squeak by with 15 points, passing and landing in the D tier. Moving on to the Baratier, where we have a feast. Here we meet the first warlord, Dracul Mihawk Zapenta. Okay, but let's be real, Mihawk is just cool. Like, one of the most clean and well put together character designs in the series. He has devastating strength, shown off immediately as we hear about him cutting all 50 of Don Krieg's ships, dominating Zoro in a fight, and then we learn that he is Shanks' rival. Of course, we don't get too much time with him because he's more of an endgame figure, but he does stay relevant throughout the story as he is Zoro's ultimate goal. Of the times that we do see him though, he is in Marineford almost killing Luffy. During the time skip, he mentors Zoro, he fends off the Marines after losing his title of Warlord, and most recently he formed Cross Guild with Buggy and Crocodile. It is hard not to love this character, and he gets full marks in design and strength and impact, but he falls short in the other categories. He isn't really a character that deals with morality outside of just doing what he wants. He is neither evil nor good, he is just self-serving. He's definitely dangerous, but outside of Marineford, he's never really a threat to the crew. He is a neutral force with the potential to be very deadly, so he gets a 4 there. And finally, we know nothing about him outside of being Shanks' rival, and in the most recent SBS, Oda told us he was betrayed by the Marines and became a warlord to live an undisturbed life. 
if we had some kind of compelling storyline for Mihawk, beyond just that he is very strong and very cool, that would be great. But he just doesn't have much there. However, Mihawk is the first example of characters I'm calling walls. Walls are meant specifically to demonstrate how weak the crew still is and how far they have to go. Obviously, he's more of a wall for Zoro, as that's quite literally the end goal, but we also see him playing this role for Luffy in Marineford, as Luffy recognizes him as someone he cannot attack without putting his own life in danger. Other walls will include Crocodile, Aokiji, Kuma, and of course, Kaido. Now, speaking of Zoro, Mihawk is also a representative for another category, the Nemesis. These are antagonists which have their own storylines tied specifically to a designated straw hat. For example, Mihawk with Zoro, Emu and Blackbeard with Luffy. Other straw hats might get involved, but they're really there for those individual characters. But as for Mihawk though, with 24 points, he lands in the A tier. As for the villain of the Baratie, we have Don Krieg, the largest naval force in the East Blue, and a famously tyrannical captain who will lie, cheat, and steal to get what he wants. He is the ultimate example of selfishness and ego, which is demonstrated by his golden armor. He fights with an explosive spear, poisonous gas, spiked capes, and mounted guns hidden in that armor, and he does anything he can to fight dirty and make sure that he is never on the back foot. If Kuro is an example of how not to be a leader, then Krieg shows us the darkest side of what it means to be a pirate, to kill indiscriminately, to steal, and to even threaten those who feed you. Unfortunately, he is pretty low impact on the story as a whole, and his own story is kind of generic and vapid, but overall he makes it to the C tier with 18 points thanks to his underhanded ruthlessness. But with that, we finally reach the most iconic antagonist in the East Blue, the Fishman Arlong. This is the culmination of everything that the East Blue had to offer. This is the first time that a villain in the series is actually terrifying. Arlong towers over our crew, he is stronger, faster, and when it comes to Luffy and Zoro, he's even smarter. But then we also incorporate that underhandedness and plotting that we got to see glimpses of in Krieg and Kuro. The way he holds Nami hostage with their deal, only to have the marines go in and take everything from her. Him killing Bellamere. This guy isn't just powerful, he emotionally breaks us. It is the first time that we see this level of depth and comprehensiveness in an enemy like this. But one of the things that makes him so special though, is that he is the first enemy to fit into the important category that I'm calling nightmares. If Luffy is all about making dreams come true, Arlong is all about destroying dreams and making people live out their worst fears. Fittingly, these characters tend to be the most terrifying as they go out of their way to ruin lives. He takes pleasure in making humanity suffer, and it's something that's very much unlike anything we've seen before. Sure, Krieg and Kuro are bastards, but the difference in how they act in comparison to what Arlong does to Nami is gigantic. They do not hold a candle to him purely in terms of savagery. He is the whole package in our first encounter with him, but then we head to Sabaody and Fishman Island, where we learn about the rest of his life. How humanity had discriminated against Fishman, how Fisher Tiger fought to mend that relationship against Arlong's advice, and how Fisher had been killed for trying to be kind to humans. Everything about his character and his story just works so perfectly and meshes with the themes and events of Arlong Park in such a beautiful and effective way. This is a near-perfect character, and I think clearly he lands in the S tier with 29 points. And wrapping up the East Blue antagonists, we have Smoker. Smoker is a character that we have been waiting for the payoff to for over two decades. Like Mihawk, Smoker is just straight up cool. He has the first Logia powers that we see, which makes him feel untouchable because he is. But then we see this very strong sense of justice that is challenged more and more each time he crosses paths with the Straw Hats. 
There's the strict all pirates are evil mentality that he has in Logtown, but then in Alabasta, Luffy has Zoro save him, and Luffy stops the marine-sanctioned warlord Crocodile. Then in the New World, they are forced to work together to stop Caesar Clown, and by then, we have this silent agreement between these two where Smoker knows that the Straw Hats aren't all that bad. We even see this mentality evolving and moving forward as we learn more about people like Kobe, Aokiji, and Fujitora. Smoker is like a modern Garp who recognizes the flaws in the world government, but still truly believes that the Marines are a net positive and understands that without them, the non-Straw Hat pirates would lay the world into ruin. This places Smoker into another new category, opposing values. Characters who truly believe that what they are doing is right, but still find themselves in conflict with the Straw Hats. The thing is, Smoker isn't wrong. 99% of pirates are monsters in this world. Where he does get it wrong though, is that he tunnel visions on Luffy and makes him a symbol. If Luffy is a good pirate, then the core philosophy that he has built his life around suddenly has a hole in it, and it calls into question a lot of his life in general. So he needs to chase Luffy to prove that he is a bad pirate. Smoker doesn't dislike Luffy. They just happen to be on opposite sides of things, and he plays that hand accordingly. But the coolest part of all of that is how it is incorporated into his character design. Over time, Smoker starts to understand that things aren't always black and white, and aren't always clear. Sometimes there is gray, and things get cloudy. A very fitting thematic to a character who has smoke-based devil fruit powers. Now, the issue with Smoker is that I feel we are missing a key part to his story. He just feels incomplete and there's no payoff for everything that we've seen so far. Not only that, but because we only see him so sparingly, he is left in this kind of weird limbo where he never really progresses. I have no doubt that Smoker will be ranked higher later, but based on where he is now, I gotta drop him in the B tier with 23 points. On to the Grand Line, where Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday of Baroque Works show up at Reverse Mountain. These Team Rocket wannabes are 99% here for comedic effect, and aren't really trying to be taken seriously in any way, shape, or form. I guess I could see some people liking the gimmick, but it definitely isn't for me. Honestly, I'm usually more annoyed by these two than anything else at this point, which is saying a lot, because I f***ing love Vivi as a character. That said, these are some of the lowest stats in the series, there's no threat, no real interesting morality, no strength, and very little story or impact. Now, to be fair, Miss Wednesday being Vivi and all that adds points, but when it comes to Baroque Works duos, I'm going to be evaluating them as pairs within the respective arcs because that's how we deal with them within the story. So while Vivi is given points because of her story and impact, Mr. Nine offers nothing, bringing us to a grand total of nine points. Those two end up hitching a ride from the Straw Hats, and we arrive on Whiskey Peak, an island where secret Baroque Works agents get the crew drunk out of their minds so that they can get the jump on them. This operation is led by Igarom, who is a Baroque Works agent posing as the mayor of Whiskey Peak. This is classic double agent action. He has a very small army of agents under his control, and as Zoro is the only Straw Hat awake, it becomes a 1 versus 100 battle where Baroque Works is completely dominated. Again, to be fair, Igarom isn't supposed to be a big bad or anything like that, but still, it isn't a great showing. One thing that he does have going for him is his really goofy hair rifles. It's very dumb, but it's fun and original and memorable. We also see Igram turn to the Straw Hats and beg them to protect Vivi as well in this arc, and speaking of which, that brings us to our next category, exposition. Some characters in the series also function to tell us something more about the story. For example, Igarom tells us all about Alabasta. We also have Crocodile later on explaining the existence of ancient weapons, and Charlos being a representation of Celestial Dragons as a whole. Regardless of the category though, we have another really low score here with ones in morality, strength, and threat, however some points for design, story, and impact, again leaving us with a 9. With all the agents that we've seen up to this point being complete jokes, we also come across Mr. Five and Miss Valentine's here. Another Baroque Works pair, this time given a considerable bump in power thanks to each having devil fruits. 
And that's kind of cool, since these are the fifth and sixth devil fruits that we see at all in the series, if we're only sticking with canon. Before these, only Buggy and Smoker have had devil fruits, so it's kind of cool that these characters introduce the idea of them becoming more mainstay in the Grand Line. While they are stronger than Igram by a mile, they're still made fools of by being beaten by collateral damage from Luffy and Zoro fighting. They show up as these badass assassins only to get clowned on. It's very rough. But they do get a second showing in Little Garden, where Mr. Five in particular is shown to be very savage against Usopp. It shows us that these guys are mid-level threats who get mismatched against Luffy and Zoro, but when they're paired against normal crew members like Usopp, they actually get their time to shine. Overall, they're just fairly average, with the exception of what I consider to be really solid designs and nearly non-existent impact and personal stories outside of that. They score an even 15 and just pass into the D tier. While on Little Garden, we also meet Mr. Three and Miss Golden Week, ironically the only artists in a group called Baroque Works. Thematically, I love the idea of Mr. Three sculpting objects out of wax and then having Golden Week paint them. However, in practice, most of their interactions are isolated. Mr. Three ends up being a pretty scary opponent, especially because of his big candle platform trap that Zoro, Nami, and Vivi end up on, because the idea of being suffocated by wax as it covers you inside and out is horrifying to think about, and at the same time we have Miss Golden Week who's able to control people's emotions with her paint, something that turns a normally hopeful moment of Luffy arriving onto the battlefield into one of the most frustrating and despair-ridden sections of the story in its entirety. It's a set of moments that are unlike many other in the series where even with Luffy present, things still feel like the Straw Hats are doomed. Emotionally, this conflict is fun and tense, which just leaves me with the question, why isn't it satisfying? And I think a big portion of the answer to that is that Mr. Three is just kind of a dweeb. We have these very difficult and stressful moments, but the dude in charge of them feels like he is still being shoved into lockers by his high school bullies. We of course also see Mr. Three and Impel down as the secondary sidekick to Luffy and Buggy, and he's even a hugely impactful figure in freeing Ace and Marineford, as he is the one who makes the set of keys for them. But even so, eventually, like Alvida, he just joins Buggy's crew where he fades into obscurity. Now he's the comic relief to the comic relief. Meanwhile, Miss Golden Week completely vanishes after Little Garden, despite her being the more interesting character. Overall, the idea is there, but due to the lack of character depth and Mr. Three's general lameness, again, we're squeaking these guys into the D rank. After defeating them, the crew leaves Little Garden, but Nami is bitten by a bug, and we are forced to stop in the Drum Kingdom where we meet Wapple. And good lord, are there very few characters I hate more than Wapple. He is loud, he's obnoxious, he is evil purely for the sake of being evil because he is so selfish, but there is no twist to make that character arc an interesting one. He doesn't learn a lesson, he doesn't teach the protagonist anything, he just consumes everything around him until there is nothing left for him to take. And while that is fitting for his devil fruit, it just doesn't have the development or background needed to make him feel interesting. At the very least, I would say he has a memorable design, and it seems clear that he and Vivi will have some kind of arc together going forward, but just based on what we've seen so far, he's just such a flat character with nothing to show. And for the record, flat evil characters can be done well, and One Piece has characters like them in the story. Look at Doflamingo, he is evil but he has a reason. There are surrounding factors, he's built into a force of nature of a character, he is evil, he will always be evil, and that's it. But the pieces of Doflamingo that make him great just aren't there with Wapple. So how does he stack up? Well, he just passes. Because he has such a strong sense of immorality and selfishness, I unfortunately have to give him a 5 there. He's a king of the evil drum kingdom and the creator of Wapo Metal, so he has political and economic power, and he is being brought back into the story so he has some staying power and incoming impact. So with all of that, he gets just enough points to reach into the D tier at 15. On to one of my favorite big bads in the series with the warlord Crocodile in Alabasta. From the mob boss aesthetic to the top tier voice acting in both English and Japanese, everything about Crocodile screams confidence. 
He doesn't think he is better, he knows it. Top that off with him being the second Logia user in the series, and thus making him nearly untouchable, and you got a character who feels like a huge threat. On top of that, he has this whole Machiavellian schemer vibe going on as he robs the country of its reign, frames the king, and presents himself as the hero that everyone has been waiting for. And all of this is totally sanctioned because he is a warlord for the marines. It's genuinely a very unique and interesting plot. He plunges the nation into a civil war, he plants a bomb in the middle of the capital city so that even if his plan fails, all the warriors in the country will be taken care of, leaving no one to oppose him. It's levels on levels of planning and strategy that make him feel like what Captain Kuro wanted to be, all backed up by a Logia fruit and a gigantic underground spy organization. His original plan, of course, was set up so that he could find Pluton, however, with Robin's betrayal and Luffy cheesing him with water and blood, things start crashing down around him, literally. He then reappears as we reach Impel Down, but this time as an ally, joining the fight in Marineford and later forming Cross Guild with Buggy and Mihawk. And all of that doesn't even bring in the fact that Crocodile left Luffy on Death's Door twice. No one has done that to him so far in the series, and it really acts as this way of showing that Luffy might not be ready as the enemies in the Grand Line become more powerful. Genuinely, there are very few ways I think that we could improve him, but it would probably be through fleshing out his backstory with Eva or Whitebeard just a little bit more. It could really go far in adding some depth behind his character, but realistically, he is just great. 27 points and another entry into S tier. For all the good that I had to say about Crocodile though, Bellamy falls short in just as many ways. He's got that big fish in a small pond vibe, and now he's in the Grand Line swinging his meat around with the same energy, only to constantly get humbled. He is loud, he's obnoxious, and he's kind of a stand-in for the mental image that I have of a generic pirate crew in the world of One Piece. The only thing that he really has going for him is his character arc, starting as this wannabe hotshot, being discarded by Doflamingo at his lowest point, and looking to Luffy, the same pirate he shit-talked, for salvation. That shift in tone also makes his sense of morality kind of interesting, and we even see him giving up on being a pirate later in the series. Outside of that though, both of his designs are super boring in my opinion. He thinks he has strength, but the whole point of his character is that he doesn't. He never really feels like a threat, especially considering Luffy and Zoro don't even feel the need to fight back against him, and his overall impact on the story is kind of minimal. He's very middling overall, which is fitting as he scores 14 points. Up in Skypiea, we have the lightning god Enel. The whole mysticism of the arc surrounding God and the general sense of wonder involved in Skypiea does so much for building up this sense of gravity around him. It's one thing to battle against a warlord, but the idea of fighting a god is just on another scale. Not to mention we have those moments of lightning crashing from the sky and smiting any dissenters. Even the element that he uses feeds into this idea because of how tied together lightning is with mythology in our own world. I mean, when it comes to mythological gods, Zeus or Thor are like the first ones to pop in your head most likely. On top of that, Skypiea has this really cool blending of mythologies and religions. For example, we have the Christian style aesthetic for heaven and its worshippers, a Greek style god with a Buddhist and Shinto inspired design, and a group of colonized Shandians modeled after Mesoamerican iconography. This arc is such a cool melting pot of religions and at the center of all of them is Enel. Top that all off with a sense of confidence that is even more inflated than crocodiles, and the ability to read minds, and you have this truly godlike being. I do wish that he was explored just a bit more, or even had some follow-up from his time on the moon, and obviously Luffy being made of rubber really bites into how threatening this guy can actually be, but overall he's just a phenomenal villain and makes it into the A rank very easily. Now, going on from some of my favorites to quite literally my least favorite. We are now at Long Ring Long Land with Foxy, and much like the Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday duo, Foxy is a comedy-based character and is hard to take seriously. 
He challenges the Straw Hats to a Davy Dogback fight, where they are forced to put their crew members up as ante for the games that they play. It's about as silly as we ever get in One Piece, but it's just too much for me at least. I understand that it could be fun because we have this really unique situation set up where the villain, Foxy, has no real sense of morality, no impact on the story, and no personal backstory either. However, the idea of losing crewmates is pretty threatening in its own way. But unfortunately, Foxy just isn't that interesting or well-developed. He feels like he's trying too hard to be funny, to actually be funny, and he's just very annoying, so he gets a 9. Aokiji, on the other hand, is super cool. We find him on the way to Water 7, and he's just this giant of a man who nonchalantly talks about how Robin will betray us. He is also a Logia user, which, especially in these early One Piece arcs, means that we can't deal with him at all. More specifically though, he is the first enemy in the Grand Line to completely beat Luffy. There is no round 2 or round 3 like there is with Crocodile, it is simply them fighting, Luffy getting turned to ice almost immediately, and Aokiji choosing to spare him to pay back a debt to Garp. Just like with Crocodile, this is another warning sign to Luffy and the crew that he is getting in over his head. And that brings up a pretty interesting point with Aokiji. Just like Smoker, he is aware of the shortcomings of the Marines and the world government. He used to be passionate, but after seeing what terrible things were happening, he lost that and began drifting, doing what he believed to be right over what he is ordered to do if he gets the chance to do so. For example, saving Luffy and sparing Robin. This leads to him clashing with Akainu after Sengoku steps down, as they both have very different visions of what the Marines should be doing going forward. And after he is defeated, Aokiji steps down from the Marines and ends up joining the Blackbeard Pirates. We still don't know the extent of this, but at this point, the best guesses are that he is either just straight up looking to become a pirate to take down the corrupt system that he abandoned, or he is acting as a double agent under Sword. Either way, both those storylines are kinda excellent, and this cold boy goes into the A tier. While Frankie wasn't really a big bad for an arc, he was framed as an antagonist throughout Water 7. Early on, he was even shown to be strong enough to give Luffy a run for his money, however, the more we learned about him, the faster we started to realize that he has a heart of gold. He creates the Frankie family as a means of giving the lost and downtrodden a second chance of life in the city. While everyone else saw them as thugs, they were actually just people with nothing left that Frankie had given a home and family to. And this is why Frankie is a perfect example of someone you might see in the category of fast friends. Fast friend characters are typically introduced as villains or antagonists, however, through either common goals or circumstance, they end up working with our protagonist instead. Other examples of this in the story are Boa Hancock and Smoker, although in his case it might be better to call it Slow Friends. Frankie, of course, joins us as Robin is taken away, and we learn about Tom and all that, and it's just a well-developed short story all around. Obviously, this was a very short-term thing, but I think Frankie made a very fun and endearing antagonist, and it's a great example of how antagonists don't need to be evil and can offer something of value as well. It's why we wanted him to join the crew, in the same way that we want characters like Katakuri to be involved in the story going forward. So, solid B tier for Frankie. The actual big antagonist for Water 7, though, is Usopp. Through our journey, Usopp had been developing a feeling of insecurity when stacked up against his companions. He simply cannot compete with monsters like Luffy, Sanji, and Zoro, and that had been eating at him for quite a while. But this is when that moment comes to a peak, as the Mary is damaged, and Luffy needs to make the difficult choice to find a new boat because he doesn't want to put his crew at risk on the ocean. The Mary is very sentimental to Usopp, as it was a gift from Kaya and kind of ties him to her and his hometown no matter where he goes. But at the same time, in this moment, the Mary also represents himself. He is worried that he isn't good enough, and now that the Mary isn't useful, she is being abandoned. He thinks that if their home can be tossed away, then surely once he's no longer useful, they will cast him aside too. This ultimately leads to he and Luffy fighting, and it is everything I ever wanted to see from Usopp. He plants traps, he has a strategy, he knows he can't win but stands his ground like the great warrior that he wants to be. Usopp isn't the most powerful, 
but there's so much around this conflict and what it represents. It leads to Luffy being forced to learn to be a better captain, Zoro standing his ground as first mate and threatening to leave if Usopp is forgiven lightly, and all the emotional turmoil that this situation entails. Not to mention, it contrasts Frankie beautifully, the old and worn down being replaced with this shiny new technology. The fear of being left behind in Usopp put up against the guy who takes in people that society forgot about. It is all just very well put together, and it makes for an A-tier antagonist. On to Annie's Lobby, where we have the leader of CP9, Spondo. This is yet another character built up for comedic effect. We have the whole group of deadly assassins being led by a bumbling idiot. However, where I think that Foxy and Wapple failed this idea, Spondum actually pulls it off. And a big part of that is that while we have him around being a dumbass, we also have Rob Lucci looming behind him as an actual threat. It's very similar to what we'd see with Orochi and Kaido in Wano. Spondum is super annoying. He's massively insecure, and he is constantly trying to prove how great he is in every situation. But what really makes him stand out is that this dude, with all of these issues, essentially has the launch codes. An overgrown child with the ability to send CP9 to do his bidding, or even summon a buster call when he doesn't get his way. It's instability and chaos that all works surprisingly well. This instability also leaks into how he treats prisoners. While people like Smoker or Garp would be in control of themselves at all times, Spondum lashes out, for example, smacking Robin when he's upset. Even if he is in control of a situation, he isn't in control of himself. We haven't gotten to see much of his role in CP9, but I am curious to see what they will do with his character, and how they're going to justify bringing him back and putting him in a position with even more power. Definitely not my favorite antagonist, and definitely not someone I enjoy seeing on screen, but he is well written enough to fall into the B tier. Above him, we have the actual threat for Eddie's Lobby with Rob Lucci. There's a lot to love about Lucci, his design is clean and sharp, he's got this cold ruthlessness, and his fight with Luffy is absolutely excellent. However, what I think I like most about him is in the morality category, because in that case, he is a perfect reflection of Luffy. Luffy is all about freedom, doing what you want, when you want, and helping people you care about regardless of the consequences. But Luchi has no free will. It doesn't matter what the situation is, Luchi will always follow orders. He's a blank slate that does what he is told, and is willing to hurt anyone if it meets his goals. On top of that, he represents the absolute pinnacle of Luffy's strength at this point in the story. CP9 is the best that the government has to offer, and Luffy can fight their leader to a standstill, just barely taking the win out of pure tenacity. Why this is important is that since Crocodile, Luffy had been meeting bigger and bigger walls while always overcoming them, and Luchi is really the last one that he manages to defeat until the time skip. Luchi is the sum total of all of Luffy's growth and effort. Of course, we'll see him again at Egghead Island, he's a bit of a disappointment there, but at the end of the day, even if he is Fraud Luchi, he is still Rob Luchi, and that is enough to get him into A tier. After Eni's lobby, the crew comes across Vice Admiral Garp, who happens to be Luffy's grandfather. Like Smoker, this is a character who fully believes that he is doing the right thing by saving people from pirates. He sees the necessity in the Marines, but he also knows that the system is f***ed. It's something that a few characters all share, but it's something that I always love, and Garp is just the pinnacle of it, to the point where he even refused to become an admiral because he would be forced to act under the Gorosei and Celestial Dragons. On top of that, there's this feeling of legacy where he was Roger's rival, he's training Kobe, and all of that builds him into this really iconic character. Plus, the idea of this super-powered world where people are made of rubber or ice or can turn into a giraffe just makes it very funny when one of the strongest characters is just some old dude who punches real good. Post time skip, he hasn't done too much, but seeing him in conflict with Aokiji was great, and getting to see what he is really capable of on Hachinosu was fantastic. Garp also has a huge heart, which makes it difficult whenever we come across him. Marineford showed us his dedication to duty, but also shows us how much he loves his family, with him threatening Akainu being one of my favorite scenes in the entire series. 
And then there's him hyping himself up to fight Luffy, only to not be able to go through it. Of all the characters in the series, Garp is probably the one who finds himself in the most complicated position morally, and it gives so much depth and flavor to his character in a really effective way. He is a very simple person who finds himself in a very complex situation, and it works really well. A tier. Now, over to one of my least favorite arcs and villains with Thriller Bark's Moria. Something I do like about Moria is that he is a failed version of Luffy. He ventured into the Grand Line to find the One Piece. He hit a Kaido-shaped wall and then packed it in. Keep in mind, this part of the story is all about Luffy and his crew hitting a wall in the same way. They are in the process of figuring out that they aren't ready for the new world, but rather than quitting, they persevere. It's a really nice parallel. In terms of Moria himself though, his devil fruit is insane, allowing him to produce a zombie army and even turning the straw hats into shadowless husks that can't enter the sunlight. In terms of power, Moria has a whole island of zombies. Hogback is behind him, Hirona, and Absalom, and even just his shadow is more than enough to fight off Luffy on his own while Moria just sleeps behind it. Meanwhile, Moria's biggest issue is his pride and stupidity. After Oars leaves the Straw Hats completely worn out, the sun is about to rise and victory is basically assured. However, Moria decides to use Shadow Asgard, which just turns him into a massive target and stops fighting with his shadow like he had in the past. This swap in his strategy is the worst thing he could have done, and it turns this unwinnable situation for the Straw Hats into an opportunity for them to take the W. It's kind of disappointing, and instead of making it feel like Luffy's triumph, it feels like Moria's fumble. We see him again briefly at Marineford, where Jinbei just dunks on him, and once again on Hachinose, where Blackbeard has either killed him to steal his fruit or taken him prisoner. Either way, he has continued to be made into a joke. In terms of his design, I'm pretty mixed on Moria. On the one hand, he is ugly as sin, but on the other, he is extremely unique and really nails that Tim Burton aesthetic that Thriller Bark was going for. And finally, Moria's morality is kind of generic. It's more like he's a lazy dude trying to avoid work than he's a bad dude trying to be evil. He makes the zombie army so he doesn't have to do anything himself, not to pillage and plunder. And yes, there is the argument for him making zombies so he doesn't have crew that he can actually lose, but I don't really think that's enough to save it. He's just kind of doing his own thing and wants to be left alone, and it's honestly like a burnout version of Mihawk in a lot of ways. Which is fitting since he's kind of another Halloween, scary movie kind of themed character. But when we tally all of this up, and it kills me to say this, but while I would like to mark him as a failure, Moria lands in the B tier. God, I feel like I gotta wash my mouth out. On to the other antagonist of Thriller Bark, we have Kuma. Kuma has always been one of the most interesting characters in the series, but with the recent flashback arc, he might have jumped into my top 10 characters for One Piece in general. Kuma is an imposing force. He is the wall that the Straw Hats were leading up to that they aren't able to overcome. He's supposed to make them know that they are in over their heads, and that's why he first comes across the crew right after their battle with Moria. They had just put everything into that fight. Luffy is still unconscious, and everyone else is too tired to really fight back. Even the ones who do stand against Kuma can barely scratch him. And then you get into his devil fruit. The bomb of air that he releases, the way he seems to warp from place to place in an instant, the way every attack bounces off of his hand or can't even break through his steel body. And of course, how he makes people vanish just by touching them. He feels unstoppable in the same way that Logias do, honestly. They just can't touch him. But more importantly, he is a message saying you can try your hardest and you might even win some battles, but at the end of the day you are too weak to progress. What's interesting with Kuma right off the bat though is this strong moral code that he seems to be working with. He had been sent to kill Luffy, but seeing Zoro's courage and loyalty causes him to oppose the world government instead. He is presented as this cold, unfeeling machine, but he clearly has a heart and admires those with conviction and integrity. Even with that in mind though, his generosity doesn't come free, and the price for allowing Luffy to live was putting Zoro through hell. The next time we'd see him was on Sabaody, where there are multiple of him all over the island, the pacifista. They all have the power and threat associated with the cyborg Kuma, 
but none of the humanity or the heart. And the pacifista not so subtly represent that there isn't just one Kuma in the Grand Line, there will be dozens of people like him that the Straw Hats will need to overcome. In other words, if they keep going, they will die. And when the real Kuma arrives, he just whispers some sweet nothings into Rayleigh's ear, and then one by one, he dismantles the crew in one of the most intense moments in the series. For those keeping track, Kuma is responsible for both Nothing Happened and the Straw Hat Separation, two of by far the most iconic scenes that the story has to offer. And as we'd find out, Kuma is actually acting as a double, or triple agent, I guess. He was a revolutionary forced to work for the world government, who was losing his humanity as they slowly turned him into a machine, and with the last of his consciousness, he chose to save the Straw Hats by sending them to locations that would help them develop their strengths and be ready for the Grand Line, rather than them getting slaughtered in Sabaody. By the time we saw the actual Kuma two years later, he is just an empty shell. But even so, he had guarded the Thousand Sunny while the Straw Hats were away. Finally, Egghead gave us his backstory and added so much depth to his character. Kuma is from the nearly extinct Buccaneer race, which is why he has such a strange body. And he was taken as a slave by the world nobles along with his mother and father. When his mother died, his father comforted him by talking about the sun god Nika that would come to save him, but unfortunately in doing so he made too much noise and was killed by one of the nobles. When Kuma finally found himself free, he joined the revolutionaries with the love of his life Ginny, but she would get kidnapped by the world government as well, and was made into a slave and a test subject for the Gorosei member Saturn. By the time Ginny made it out, she was pregnant and dying, leaving Kuma with her daughter Bonnie, who was also infected by the Sapphire Scale Disease meaning that Bonnie would never be able to go outside. Kuma ended up raising Bonnie with all the love in the world, and together they lived in a small village where he would take in the pain of all those around him, much like he made Zoro do. Eventually, he finds out that Bonnie would die very young because of this disease, and so he makes a deal with Vegapunk and Saturn to become a mechanical weapon for the world government in exchange for curing his daughter. This is obviously a very shortened version of it, but shows just how much love and care went into crafting this character. How someone with the biggest heart became a heartless machine, and how the biggest wall that the Straw Hats had ever come across ended up being the force that allowed them to survive and prosper. Kuma gets full marks across the board with a perfect score of 30. What an absolutely phenomenal character. On to the start of Sabaody though, where we meet Duval. This is another joke antagonist, first seen when he kidnaps Kami and Hachi. The big joke here is that he has a face that looks like Sanji's original wanted poster. Haha, <laughs> very funny. And once Sanji kicks his face into being more normal, he becomes an ally to the crew and brings the Straw Hats to the auction to save Kami. All in all, there just isn't too much to him. He's the definition of a fodder antagonist who becomes a fast friend, and once he does, he's just so goddamn annoying. Easy F tier. Unlike Duval though, there are important figures introduced in this arc, those being the Celestial Dragons. Our first real interaction with them is through Charlos, an ugly man who wears a helmet to avoid breathing the same air as the commoners. In opposition to Luffy's mission of freedom, the Celestial Dragons are immediately introduced as oppressors. We even see Charlos having his guard kill a man on the street so that he can steal his wife. Then he shows up at the auction house to try and buy Kami, and while he's there, he also just decides to shoot Hachi. Celestial Dragons are immediately demonstrated to be heartless and to have complete disregard for anyone they see below themselves which is everyone. But what really makes them terrifying is that opposing them can get you instantly killed on the spot, or summon a buster call. You have these megalomaniacal overgrown toddlers with literal god complexes and the power to back that up, while also having no sense of morality or the value of a life that isn't theirs. However, One Piece is a story which is all about showing us that anyone has the opportunity to be good or bad. There's evil marines, there's good pirates, and there are good celestial dragons. Homing and Yozgard, for example, are characters who are trying to do the right thing in the end, but in both cases are killed for doing so. With Homing specifically, we see that when celestial dragons do see humanity as equals and try to build a bridge between them, humanity attacks and tortures them unrelentingly because of all the history that has been built up. 
These two add a lot of depth to a group that would be very black and white otherwise. In general, Celestial Dragons are going to be in the B tier because of what they represent and the power at their disposal, while Charlos is just the archetype pushed to its very extreme, so he is marked a bit lower in the C tier. Finally, Sabaody also gives us our first good look at the next Admiral, Hizaru. He has the light Logia fruit, which is absolutely insane, allowing him to transform and move at the speed of light, and making him an immediately deadly force. And as has been the case with all Logia to this point, he is basically untouchable. Kizaru has something that makes him feel entirely different from other admirals like Kuzan, though. And that is the seeming total disregard for circumstance. While Kuzan was disenchanted with the marines and became lazy as a result, Kizaru is just a blank slate. He does what he is told, no questions asked, even if he doesn't want to. I mean, even Akainu makes judgement calls from time to time, though they tend to be pretty savage, but Kizaru is just a weapon, he's very similar to Rob Lucci in that way. Now, to be fair, we learn a little bit more about him in Kuma's backstory, and it isn't very clear yet, but it seems like he helps Luffy in the fight against Saturn. However, that's mostly ambiguous at this point, and it stands that Kizaru is just this brutally strong opponent that does as he is told. I wish he had a little bit more to be flushed out with, but for the time being, he is chillin' in the B tier. Of course, Kuma saves the Straw Hats from Kizaru and the Pacifistas, and in Luffy's case, he is sent to Amazon Lily, where he comes across Boa Hancock. And honestly, for how stupid of a character she can be, she's also kind of fantastic. She can be extremely annoying sometimes, don't get me wrong, but I think she strikes the balance of comic relief and heartfelt much more effectively than a lot of other examples in the show. So firstly, design. Boa is meant to be this Amazonian princess, but I do love the twist of incorporating the South American Amazon as a theme with the original Greek Amazonist tribe and Themyscira. It's a really fun idea, but then we also get into who she is as a character. This strong, proud woman who hates all men because as a child she and her sisters were taken prisoner by the Celestial Dragons, tortured, forced to eat devil fruits, and probably much more. Then there's the fact that she is a warlord who refuses to bend to the will of the marines. She uses her sexuality as a weapon rather than allowing other people to objectify her, while also having a devil fruit which quite literally allows her to objectify other people. She turns them into an object, stone. She takes advantage of both the world government and her body, the things which she had been made a victim of in the past. Not to mention that Boa is the only female character to have Conqueror's Hockey in the series until we meet Big Mom. It puts her in a very exclusive list even to this day. On top of that, in some ways Boa is the first person to see Luffy as Joy Boy, a hero of liberation fighting against the world government and even punching Charlos regardless of the consequences. But up until Luffy proves himself, Boa is ruthless. She sees him as all the terrible men she knew before, and she will even petrify her own people if it means hurting him. You have this character who is so traumatized by the abuse that she faced that she is willing to abuse others to avoid it happening again, all to be proven wrong and find out that Luffy is just a genuinely good dude. Sure, as the story progresses, she gets a bit stupid when Luffy is involved, but in general, Boa is just a badass bitch who takes no shit from anyone. Solid A tier. Now, with her help, Luffy manages to break into Impel Down to try and rescue his brother, and here he comes across Magellan. And listen, I love Magellan. I know it probably won't happen, but I am dying for a rematch fight to somehow happen because, to me, this is one of the most terrifying characters in the entire story. Magellan's fruit allows him to produce and control venom that can rob you of your senses, paralyze any part of your body that it touches, and will eventually kill you after hours of excruciating pain. While not actually being a Logia, this fruit kind of functions in a similar way. If I had to make a comparison, I'd say it's more like a poisonous version of Mr. Three or Katakuri's fruit with the added benefits of being able to coat himself in venom, so if anyone attacks him, they will be infected. And that's exactly what we see happening. Luffy is so desperate to save his brother that we see him voluntarily giving up his body to fight Magellan. He throws punches and kicks, knowing that he will lose the use of his arms and legs afterwards, but he's willing to make that sacrifice to save his brother. 
However, even when he does, he is still completely dominated by Magellan. We talked about Kuma earlier and how he dismantled the Straw Hats despite their best effort, but this moment actually has very much the same feeling. Luffy tries his best, he has everything taken from him, and he still fails. And because he can't beat Magellan here, Luffy ends up going through hours of rehab with Eva and arrives too late to save his brother. Put simply, he was too weak to save Ace. In terms of design, Magellan looks really intimidating, which is fitting for a warden, However, he also has this running gag of always needing to use the bathroom. Yes, this is a dumb joke, but it's in reference to the mythological creature known as the Belphegor. And with the added context of this being a reference at the core of his design, I think it actually really ties things together in a very unique way. Like Boa, again, we're having this comedic character that has levels to them that really works overall because they're not just played off as a joke. They're funny, they're silly, but they're also deadly serious. The only real pitfall to his character is that we don't know anything about him other than he was the Warden. There is no depth beyond what we see here, so despite how much I like him, Magellan lands in the B tier. Over at Marineford, Luffy comes across the final Admiral, Akainu. We had seen glimpses of him in Robin's backstory where he ruthlessly blew up a ship of refugees on the off chance that Robin could have been aboard, and that energy is kind of carried with him throughout the rest of the story. He will do anything and kill anyone if he believes that it is for the greater good, and in most cases this means killing pirates or threats to the world nobles. In many ways, he kind of reminds me of an extremist version of what Smoker might have been if he never met Luffy, just becoming more and more jaded over time as he has made more certain that all pirates are evil. To him, everything is black and white, and things are easily divided along the lines of the world government and everyone else. Of course, Akainu having the magma devil fruit is totally perfect for someone hot-headed who brutally kills anything he is opposed to. He is savage, full of hatred, and angry like a volcano. But he is also predatory and smart enough to take advantage of the weaknesses of his opponents. For example, insulting Whitebeard to make Ace angry enough to stay and fight him. Speaking of, obviously, Akainu is the one who kills Ace. Kind of a big deal. Then he goes on to defeat Aokiji and become Fleet Admiral. He's just incredibly powerful, he's beyond dangerous, and he always believes he is right, which makes him a devastating threat. The only thing he really loses points for are design and story. In terms of design, like, I get it, I totally understand what they're going for. Kind of feels plain, I don't know if you guys agree with that. Like, the wow factor in his character design is like a shirt that my overweight uncle would wear, you know? Then we have his story, which we just don't know enough about. Why does he hate pirates so much? What made him so ruthless? Something turned him into this, but without knowing what that is, he just feels like we're missing a piece of that puzzle. But let's be real, the dude is terrifying and easily gets into the A tier. While Akainu might be the current fleet admiral, we originally had Sengoku the Buddha. He and Garp are kind of the embodiment of the old guard. Despite having a higher rank though, I think that for some reason, Sengoku just doesn't have that feeling of legacy and grandeur that Garp does. Like, he is strong as hell, he's incredibly strategic, he is duty-bound and has the entire power of the marines at his fingertips. However, he's also rational, willing to talk, and typically pretty reasonable. Now, sometimes he's gotta do what he's gotta do, like, there's no talking him out of executing Ace. And that is an important part of his character. But I think what it really comes down to is that we rarely see Sengoku in action. He tells the marines where they gotta go, and that's kind of his role. He personally never really feels like a threat though, and even when we do see him fighting at Marineford, he doesn't accomplish all that much. Like, they show him as this big threat, but Luffy just kind of bounces him off. Tell me any of the admirals fighting Luffy wouldn't have done way better in that situation. Sengoku is this character that I know I like, I know he's strong, and I know he has everything going for him. But he just doesn't do or show us anything that's super special, you know? He's like the perfect example of someone who does everything just fine, but excels at nothing, or at least doesn't show us that he does. Which is why he's going into the B tier. Now, another big one shows up in Marineford with Blackbeard. Yes, I know we first saw him in Jaya and Impel Down, but considering he orchestrated Marineford, we're gonna cover him here. Off the bat, Blackbeard is another character that we are missing a lot of puzzle pieces too. However, they don't feel like empty gaps like we had with Mihawk. Instead, they are mysteries. 
We have all the surrounding details and we just need those last clues to solve everything. It's why there are more theories about Blackbeard than anyone else in the series, with maybe the exception of Joy Boy. We have theories about multiple personalities, his ties with Zebek, Cerberuses, Krakens, Chimeras, Vegapunk, and like a dozen other things. People are dying to know more about this dude, but not knowing here doesn't feel like we're missing out and it instead engages the audience more. That said, let's talk about just how special he really is. Firstly, Blackbeard is the most pirate-looking pirate in the series, even being named after one of the most famous pirates ever in our own world. And then there is what might be the most unique introduction to a villain in Shonen. We had heard his name from Ace in both Drum Kingdom and Alabasta. He's this deadly pirate, right? So how do we meet him? How do we show how terrifying he is? Well, the dude's eating pie. That's it. The whole setup for showing us Blackbeard was just demonstrating that he is the anti-Luffy. He likes a pie, Luffy hates it. Luffy likes a drink, Blackbeard doesn't. Luffy is small and thin, Blackbeard is big and round. But something really strange happens when Luffy bumps into him after leaving the bar. Blackbeard does his whole monologue about how the dreams of men will never die, and Luffy is silent. We were like 200 chapters in at this point. We fought corrupt marines, fishmen that conquered and tormented a village for a decade, and a warlord responsible for stealing a nation's water. No matter who it was, Luffy had always been so fast to call them out and fight back. But when it comes to Blackbeard, he just stares silently. It's a moment that takes the Luffy out of Luffy. Blackbeard also has his whole thing with Shanks. He killed Whitebeard. He has the darkness and quake fruit. He can steal devil fruits, his crew is full of the most dangerous prisoners from Impel Down, and he's just the whole package when it comes to what I want to see in a One Piece villain. And I'm sure, as we find out more, he will only get better. But even with the missing elements of his story, he's still squeaking into that S-tier category. Following Blackbeard is always going to be a rough time, but like, Blue Jam has to do it of all people. For those who don't remember him, he is the big bad for the Ace and Luffy flashback arc. He's just a scummy pirate who makes a deal with the nobles by sacrificing his own people, only to be betrayed and left to die in the fire of Grey Terminal. Listen, when the guy is set up to be the big bad for literal children and still loses, it's just hard to take him seriously. He really doesn't have much to offer, there isn't much to say about him. I mean, he is strong and threatening to children, but like, good for him, I guess? F tier, no question. And that actually brings us through all of the major pre-time skip antagonists and villains. As we move into the return to Sabaody, we come across Damaro Black. This is the fake Luffy, and there isn't much to say about him either. It's another gag opponent, but I really can't think of any redeeming characteristics about this dude. Bottom of F tier. Now after leaving Sabaody, we go to Fishman Island and have two more villains. One being arguably the creepiest dude in all of One Piece, and the other is Hody Jones. Admittedly, it's not much better. Hody rides the coattails of Arlong, Jinbei, and Fisher Tiger. However, he doesn't stick the landing like those characters do. He grew up idolizing Arlong and shaped his whole sense of morality and justice around how much Arlong hated humanity. But whereas Arlong was interesting and introduced a unique and compelling story involving one of the Straw Hats directly, and also represented a cycle of hatred and how it spreads, Hody is just kind of middling. He isn't a representative of that cycle, he is a consequence of it. And sure, that's okay on its own, but it just kind of falls flat and doesn't hit a lot of those important notes. Honestly, the most interesting part of the Hody encounter is that Luffy is forced to fight underwater. However, you gotta remember that this is the arc where the Straw Hats come back from their training. Hody and his crew are quite literally just there to show us how much stronger the Straw Hats have become, and as a result, he just feels like a joke. He doesn't do anything wrong, he just doesn't stand out either, and that leaves him in the C tier. That said, I would take Hody over Vanderdecken quite literally every time. He's basically just a predator who has been obsessed with a teenage girl since she was a child. And honestly? Pretty gross. His devil fruit lets him throw things and guarantee they will fly towards Shirahoshi, which makes him super scary for exactly one person, but literally a non-threat to anyone else. He's just gross and lame, and there isn't much good about him. F tier, obviously. 
Now, from someone who likes kids way too much, to someone who prefers to experiment on them, we jump to Punk Hazard, where we meet Caesar Clown. Caesar is a gas Logia user, which is pretty relevant as Logias have been our crew's biggest weakness through the entire series. While Hody and his crew stood to show off the Straw Hat's growth as a whole, Caesar is a chance to see what Luffy can do personally, and once they actually get to a fair fight, Luffy basically one-shots him with hockey-enhanced gear third. He is a note to the audience that Logias are not untouchable anymore, and the new king of power scaling is hockey. Now, design-wise, Caesar is a much different take on the clown theming than Buggy was, which is kinda neat, but it does kinda make him feel like a repeating theme and like he lacks his own identity. Luckily, his anything-to-prove-myself-a-true-scientist mentality allows him to stand out by being a different kind of evil than Buggy ever was, specifically by using children in experiments and helping to create these smile devil fruits. Of course, we've also learned more about his history with Vegapunk and all that, and even then, he just kind of feels like we're missing something important to make him feel like a real, defined character and not just a comic relief mad scientist. Something that I think really makes him feel less significant, though, is that he isn't the big bad and you feel it. You have both Doflamingo and Kaido above him, and because of that, you're kind of dealing with like a third or fourth tier threat. He's just fine, and that lands him in the B tier. Now, speaking of Doflamingo, we find him in Dressrosa. Obviously, there's a ton of parallels between him and Crocodile, using a secret organized crime ring to take control of a nation. In Dofi's case, he actually succeeds, though, and you Using Sugar's powers, he turns anyone and everyone who opposes him into toys, and this also erases the memory of them from anyone who knew them. Even scarier than that, though, is his ability to attach threads to people and completely control them, as we see him do when he forces King Riku to slaughter his own people, all before showing up and presenting himself as a hero. Dofi as a character has literally everything you could want, an extremely unique and vibrant design, probably one of the most interesting in the entire series. Then on top of that, he has one of the most well-defined backstories from any antagonist in the story. His father was a celestial dragon that decided they should descend from Rijwa to live among humanity, only for the people he tried to connect with to make him regret ever trying. Those people forced the Don Quixote family to eat garbage to the point where his mother eventually dies from a lack of nutrition. And the rest of the family was tortured and strung up on a wall above a fire. Even when they tried to return to the Celestial Dragons, their family was turned away from them. So Dofi grew up having seen that there is no place for him, and that kindness is just something that gets you punished. If the world was like this, then it's better to just burn it all down. And that's when he met Treble, a man who fostered that hatred and allowed him to grow up into the bastard that he became. Dofi fits into such an interesting place in the One Piece world. He's a warlord, a celestial dragon, the leader of the Don Quixote family. But more so than that, Dofi knows the greatest secret that the world government has been trying to hide. Even though he is currently at the bottom of Impel Down, he's someone we know will remain relevant for the rest of the story because he has all the answers we want. And because of that, he's one of the characters we are most excited to see return. Honestly, I can't think of anything that Oda could have done better with Dofi, so he is tied with Kuma for a perfect score and easily tops our list so far. Also on Dressrosa, we come across a new admiral with Fujitora. This is my personal favorite of the admirals by a mile. The blind swordsman trope is fantastic here, and when you combine it with his gravity devil fruit, it just makes him this completely badass opponent. Not to mention he's the first admiral that we've met to not need a Logia fruit. Again, telling us that Logias aren't the be-all, end-all of power. But I think what I like most about Fujitora is his moral code. Unlike the other admirals, Fujitora is strictly a good person. He's very similar to Smoker in that he actively is doing what he believes to be right, but he kind of feels like what I'd imagine Smoker to be like at the end of his journey. And I think of all the characters that share this trait, Fujitora wears it the most on his sleeve, which makes him really interesting to me. Especially because it leads into situations like him apologizing to the world for allowing someone like Doflamingo to take power, or opposing the warlord system in general and eventually leading to the dissolution of the entire system. There isn't much that we need to go over with him, he's just a very simple and clean character, but it's executed very efficiently. A tier. 
Once we leave Dressrosa, we arrive on Zoe and find Jack. Jack has a unique distinction on this list because he is the only character who never fought a Straw Hat. Instead, his claim to fame is his five day and night battle against the tag team force of Nekomamushi and Inuarashi. While the cat and dog swapped out between day and night, Jack continued to fight the entire time, but he ultimately decided to just use poisonous gas to win the fight. He then went on to torture his opponents and even cut off some of their limbs as he continued to interrogate them in hopes of finding Rizo. Jack's story does continue as he eventually makes it to Wano, but when you think about him, it's more than likely about his time on Zo. It really makes him stand out as something terrifying in a way that can only happen when we let him tear apart side characters instead of Straw Hats. We're never going to see someone ripping off Nami's leg, right? That's just not going to happen. But when we have side characters that we're allowed to grow attached to, and then those characters are torn apart in front of us, it leads to some pretty powerful moments. Most of this momentum that he builds, though, doesn't really build himself up, and instead just makes Kaido and his crew in general feel more intimidating and ruthless. At the same time, Jack radiates big dumb henchman energy, and it just leaves him feeling uninteresting overall. He gets the job done, but he himself isn't really anything special, so he's landing in the C tier. On to an actual threat though, and we have Big Mom in Whole Cake Island. We have a small encounter with her on Fishman Island through a transponder snail where Luffy declares war against her and claims Fishman Island to be under his protection. However, we wouldn't really deal with her directly until she has Sanji brought to Totland to marry her daughter. Big Mom, as her name suggests, has built an empire of her children, having over 80 in total with fathers from any race she could manage to seduce. On that note, the people she slept with earlier on definitely got the better end of the deal. She is like a reverse Alvita. That said, I do really like the idea of Big Mom's changing forms depending on how hungry she is, but the base form that we see her in feels so childlike and goofy, it almost doesn't feel like One Piece. That said, she is still terrifying. She is nearly impossible to hurt, she can literally tear the souls out of people, and she has a living Candyland army to fight for her. Even her backstory is pretty interesting, an abandoned child picked up by a slave trader named Mother Caramel who pretended to adopt her. Eventually, Big Mom would go into a blinding hunger pang and started to eat everything in sight, which included her adopted mother. This is actually how she got her devil fruit, which is all super unique and really cool. However, even considering that, Big Mom just feels less present and imposing than Kaido does. She's just as powerful and just as important, but something about the way her design and story comes together leaves her ironically feeling smaller. Honestly, it might just be because she's never really the major antagonist of her own arc. Like, Katakuri is the real fight for Whole Cake Island. Sure, Big Mom chases off the crew, but she never has that big fight, you know? There's never that big moment there. And in Wano, she fights Law and Kid, and if Kid is your big enemy, it's not a good show for you. Obviously, things are more about Kaido in Wano. She lands in this spot between larger than life and living in other people's shadow, and that really holds her back as a character. Then there's the whole amnesia section in Wano, which feels terrible. And at the end of all of that, like I said, she lost a fight to Kid. Like sure, Law does a lot of the heavy lifting, but still. When you consider how much Oda drags Kid through the mud, it is wild that she lost to him. In honesty though, Big Mom is still an excellent character overall that is only really held back by the lack of spotlight given to her. Even when she does get a chance to shine, that focus quickly gets shifted to someone else. But even considering that, she's obviously going into the A tier with 26 points. With that, we have finally reached my favorite antagonist, Katakuri. Off the bat, design-wise, I love his look. The badass, biker-esque aesthetic, the larger-than-life stature, completely calm, stoic, and cold demeanor, and then his goofy-ass mouth and love for donuts. It is a great mix of intimidation and the fun factor that One Piece is famous for, all without going overboard with it like his mother does. Adding on to that theme of design, though, is the idea of him being a better Luffy. Similar devil fruits, stronger future sight hockey, the whole 56 and 57 idea, all the dozens of parallels between these characters that quite literally result in the idea of Luffy needing to beat a better version of himself and to become something stronger than he has ever been before going forward. 
He's like the New World version of Kuma, the final wall that Luffy needs to overcome in order to reach the next stage of his growth, which of course we would see in Wano. What I really love about Katakuri, though, is his sense of duty and justice. You hear about him never falling on his back, and it comes across in this big showboaty way, but then you learn it's because he wants to be strong and dependable as a big brother. He isn't doing it out of pride, he's doing it out of a sense of love. It's a really interesting take on this character trope. Then, of course, in his fight with Luffy, he finds out that Flampe got involved and resulted in Luffy getting stabbed, so Katakuri stabs himself in the stomach to even things out. He just has such a cool sense of honor, and I love that when Luffy finally earns his respect and wins the battle, Katakuri allows himself to fall onto his back. It is an absolutely beautiful moment. While personally he is my favorite though, I think we're still waiting for that final payoff of his character in a similar way to Smoker. I want to see what's coming with him, but he still feels incomplete without that next step in his journey. Still 29 points, almost the top of the list. Now, the final villain for the Whole Cake arc is Sanji's father, Judge. Mad scientist that experimented on his children in the womb to basically turn them into super soldiers. That said, to him, it almost feels like an obvious step. Like, of course I'm gonna genetically modify my kids. They would be such better and more efficient warriors. There's no emotion behind him. It's just cold and calculated. Judge runs the Germa Kingdom. He knows about Zeph and puts a target on his head if Sanji ever acts against him. And he has advanced technology that allows him to clone his soldiers. In terms of power, he has a lot going for him. Honestly, he's just a pretty well-rounded character, but I think that goofy wrestler slash gladiator design takes so much away from him and makes it so hard to take him seriously. On top of that, Big Mom plays him like an absolute punk and he loses a lot of credibility there. He's a B-tier character, but it's nothing crazy special. It's just very passable overall. Over in the Revelry arc, we meet Emu. Emu is the puppet master behind the Gorosei and the secret ruler of the world. All that we know about them is that they are ruthless in ensuring their own survival and the continuance of their empire. I mean, the way they erased Lelucia just in the hopes of killing Sabo is insane. They are the ultimate representation of the celestial dragon mentality of humanity being lesser. Humans are so below Emu that to kill one, they would kill thousands. And not surprisingly, their method of doing so is almost like holding a magnifying glass above an anthill, using the power of the heavens and incinerating whatever is below them. And that's not even considering whatever their own power is. But on top of that, they have the Gorosei, the world government, all the marines under their thumbs, all the kingdoms of the world government also have to appease them. I mean, they are the ruler of the world. Honestly, even though the scale only goes up to 5 for power, I want to give them a 7. Like, I don't know what character or even kingdom in the story could compete with this. The big things that they lose points for are on design and story, obviously. All we have to go off of in terms of design is a silhouette, but to be fair, it is very distinct and unique. Even without knowing what they look like, we see the silhouette and we immediately know that it's emo. Kind of like the silhouette that Nika is known for. Isn't that a fun parallel? Still, as just an outline, you can't get too many marks. The same kind of goes for the story aspect. The idea of a secret shadow monarch is super cool, but we don't have the context or depth to make it interesting beyond just that surface level idea. Even considering those though, the feel of this character, the role that they play in the story, and the threat they pose all work together in a very clean, albeit limited way. A tier. Next up, I want to talk about the Gorosei. While we're in Marijua, we obviously get to see the Gorosei as well, and I'll be talking about them in general here. We'll cover Saturn on his own a bit later, because really, he is the only one we have more context for. So, the Gorosei, the five celestial dragons that act as the command center for the entire world to make Emu's will into a reality. In many ways, they are like Rob Lucci and Kizaru, but while carrying themselves in a more dignified light. What I mean by that is like, Lucci and Kizaru, they'll follow Emu's orders without question. However, the whole morality at the core of this is different. Lucci and Kizaru follow orders because they feel a need to. However, the Gorosei see humanity as nothing. This isn't them acting against their own kind or making difficult decisions, it is just them stomping on the insects that they are told to stomp on. Again though, we have very little in terms of real story for these characters. 
but what we have is fine enough for the time being. That said, if we don't get more information for them, obviously it'll be a huge letdown. Similarly, their designs are pretty okay. I like that they each have inspirations based on different philosophical, societal, and ethnic bases. That's super cool as the leaders of the world. But at the same time, they do just kind of feel like a couple of dudes, you know? Like, I get the idea that we're going for and why it works, but up until recently, there wasn't a real wow factor. That said, of course, on Egghead, we get that wow factor and we see their true forms, their devil fruit forms, whatever you want to call them, with each of them being based on different kinds of yokai or mythological beings. They're all pretty badass. Seeing them in action has been very cool. But without the rest of their stories, I feel like we're missing too much of an important part, and that lands them in the A tier as a group. Leaving Revelry and on to Wano, we finally take on Kaido. Like Big Mom, this dude has a small army under his control, and he is nearly impossible to injure. On top of that though, there's a whole different mythos around Kaido than there was for Big Mom. Kaido has this legend. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, Kaido wins. Kaido is a dragon. Kaido looks intimidating. In general, he feels like such a more tangible and put-together threat. But you also have to consider his long history of being captured by the marines and then living his executions. He doesn't even want to live them. Half the time that he is free in the world is spent with him trying to end his own life. The dude jumps from a freaking sky island only to get up as if he accidentally fell out of bed. And like, that's our first interaction with him. It's freaking awesome, especially in comparison to Big Mom, who we met through a phone call because she was angry she wasn't getting enough candy. Do you see how those feel very different in a very meaningful way? Admittedly, the whole thing with him being a depressed alcoholic does take away some of that tension and makes his resolve feel a bit shaky at times, but overall the vibe around this character is dealt with super well. Kaido also just straight up one-shots Luffy when they meet. If Katakuri was the final wall to show Luffy could become greater than we ever expected, then Kaido is the test of that growth. The last obstacle to demonstrate that Luffy deserves his spot on the world stage, and that the age of the old guard had come to an end, and a new era of piracy had begun with Luffy at its helm. Something we had been leading towards ever since Luffy rang the bell on Marineford. Then there's all the stuff with the poisoning of Wano Kuni, the smiles, the burning down of Odin's home, like the dude is a menace. But there is one thing in contrast to Katakuri though, and that's how they react to someone interrupting their fight. Kaido is upset about it, but in the end he just simply accepts that he won again regardless of the situation. It's very cool that these two fights are back to back, so that you can see the difference in these reactions. Katakuri was someone who values honor more than anything, whereas Kaido is a man who has lost his honor a long time ago and simply moves forward without it. He is an excellent character and falls into the high A tier. Now, also in Wano is Kozuki Orochi. Orochi comes from a family that had fallen into disgrace in Wano, and this man is the definition of dishonest and greedy. Picture Don Krieg's moral structure, on a sniveling coward who feels like the world cheated him. He is an absolute tyrant who took over Wano and reveled in the suffering of its people. With Kaido behind him, there is nothing that anyone could do to stand in their way after Odin had been defeated. And honestly, that's just a very good description of his character. A coward who has other people fight his battles, loves causing pain, and would sell out his entire country if it meant making his own life easier. This is a character that you love to hate. There are no real redeeming qualities, and while there's a backstory that makes you understand why he's like this, it does not justify or even cause you to sympathize with what he does. We want this dude dead as badly as Hiyori and the people of Wano do, and that is a powerful tool for the writer. In terms of design, that too is meant to make him unlikable. He's small with these weird bulky proportions. He has teeth that are almost similar to a Hanya mask, which is fitting because they were often used in Japanese theater, you know, what Wano was based on, to signify a jealous demon. His impact on the story is absolutely massive, especially considering how much time was spent in Wano and building up to Wano. And he is basically the root of everything that happens here. But as fucking hateable as this dude is, he works really well as an antagonist. Yes, he He's annoying. Yes, I want him off the screen the second he shows up, and yes, he is a total bastard. 
but it is hard to argue that he has a very strong place in the story. He has all the good things that Wapple had going for him, along with all the missing elements that led Wapple to feeling like such a vapid character to begin with. And because of that, we get a very surprising A-tier character for me. Now, it's been a minute since we had a truly low score, so let's talk about the final Admiral, Aramaki. One of the most interesting parts of the Admiral's characters is always their morality. Aokiji struggles to hold his belief that the Marines are doing the right thing, and because of that, is often frozen in place. Kizaru, like someone who stared at the sun for too long, blindly follows orders. Fujitora pressures and holds the Marines accountable, fitting for his devil fruit as well. And even Akainu will burn away anything in the name of justice. So what's Aramaki's thing? Well, he agrees with Akainu. That's it. Homie doesn't even have his own belief structure, he's just Akainu's fanboy, basically. Now obviously, the dude is strong. He's an admiral, after all. So he has power, and he's some kind of threat. However, this guy comes into the story at a really interesting time. When we meet the other admirals, they are all way beyond anything we can handle. Like, there's an argument for Fujitora being somewhat realistic in Dressrosa, but generally speaking, they're all monsters in comparison to where we are in the journey. But Aramaki comes into the story as the crew is stronger than they have ever been. Gear 5, Hell Mode, Genetic Enhancement, Fish Dad is here now, Zeus, Dominio Fleur. Like, the Straw Hats are not the same as when they first arrived in Wano. I don't know if it's the same for you, but in my mind, if Aramaki attacked the Straw Hats, they would just dumpster him. To be fair, I could be 100% wrong about that, but that's just because we haven't seen him do anything really. Which leads me to the real issue with him. There's no impact on the story. We don't know anything about him, his design is like, fine. He's almost a blank slate. And when that blank slate is scared off by Shanks from miles away, like I don't know what he has going for him anymore. Until we get something to go off of, he is unfortunately sitting in the F tier with 14 points. Now, the final antagonist that we come across in the Wano arc, or at the end of it at the least, is Shanks. While he isn't outright a villain, obviously, he is posing himself to be a rival to Luffy. The moment that he declared it was time for him to be the one to get the One Piece is the second he was marked as someone who was in opposition to the Straw Hats. Obviously, this is just speculation, but it's fun to talk about it, so I'm including it. So, the dude is the final remaining Yonko of the Old Guard. White Beard, Big Mom, Kaido, all gone. And he's strong enough to stop Kaido from going to Marineford and stop Aramaki from attacking the Straw Hats on Wano. And for that last one, he wasn't even present. It was just the pressure from his hockey from miles away. And his impact on the story is easily a 5 out of 5 as well. He gives Luffy the Straw Hat. He inspires him to become a pirate. He stops Marineford. He is a celestial dragon who sailed on Roger's crew and knows the location of Laughtail. Like, I know there's the meme of him never being around, but his impact in the story is unironically massive. As for his own story, he is a baby celestial dragon found by the future king of the pirates. He becomes a pirate himself, stealing the Nika fruit and becoming the final defense against Blackbeard. All of that is a pretty badass story arc. However, there's so many holes that need to be flushed out still. For example, we see him meeting with the Gorosei, but what are his current ties to the celestial dragons? We know that the Doflamingo family wasn't allowed back in Marijua after they left, so why is Shanks allowed there? How does his father fit into this? And of course, will he actively oppose Luffy at the end of the day? Because we don't know where he stands, his threat level is very up in the air. It might be the case that he would never harm the Straw Hats, which makes him a 1. Or he might fight against them, and he'd be an immediate 5. With this in mind, for now, he's going to be a 3 just to be safe. Finally, while Shanks' design is kind of iconic, it's also very meh. Like, he has red hair and a scar across his eyes, but the dude kind of looks like every DeviantArt OC that isn't a furry. Even post time skip, he just becomes more triangular, thicker. It's kind of underwhelming. Overall, though, he gets 25 points on the system, which marks him as an easy A, and if he does become a threat to the Straw Hats, that's enough points to bump him into the S tier. On to the current arc of Egghead, where York is the secret Vegapunk satellite which is working with the Gorosei so that she can be made into a celestial dragon. Now on the one hand, the fact that her actions lead to CP0, a buster call, and all of the Gorosei showing up on Egghead to tear down the island of progress is hugely impactful. 
It essentially is the burning of Ohara all over again in terms of what humanity will lose. On the other hand, I mean, look at their goofy ass. York is so lackluster in every other category, and there just really isn't any redeeming qualities. Even her morality is just, I do what I want because it benefits me. Which, at this point in the story, just flat out isn't enough in my opinion. So, for now, unless something crazy pops up, F tier, 14 points. And finally, the newest villain that we get a real look at is Saturn. As we've discussed, he is in the Gorosei, which gives him an instant 5 in strength because of the influence and power at his disposal. However, even on his own, he is crazy strong. He can freeze people in place, he can travel through magic circles, he can heal his injuries, he doesn't seem to age, and he apparently has the force, I guess? All of that before even really knowing anything about his devil fruit, if it is a devil fruit. And speaking of which, obviously this spider form is a huge bump up to his design, but the real thing to talk about is what we learned about in Kuma's backstory. Saturn is the one responsible for kidnapping Ginny, experimenting on her and ultimately leading to her death. However, this wasn't before she gave birth to Bonnie, passing on the sapphire scale disease, and ultimately leading to Kuma sacrificing himself in order to give her a second chance at life. Saturn was the cause of this disease that afflicted Bonnie and still let Kuma trade his own life to save her. This is probably one of the most evil characters in the series, without question. I'm extremely invested in seeing where his character arc ends up and learning more about his personal history, but for the time being, he is getting 28 points and makes it into the S tier. And that is all of them. All 58 One Piece antagonists marked from best to worst in terms of how well they operate within the story. There's definitely some that I'd personally mark higher or lower based on how much I enjoy or dislike them, but I think the scale we were working with kept things pretty fair. Regardless, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. Let me know who your favorite villains are in the comments and which points you disagreed with or maybe hadn't considered in the past. But either way, until next time, I hope you all remember to stay excellent.